Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Brooke Alford. For those of you who I don't know, I am currently the president of the board for Central Chapter of um, Indiana Native Plant Society, who plans these monthly presentations, as well as an urban ag and natural resource educator for Purdue Extension Marion County, who hosts these presentations. So thank you again for joining us tonight. We are fortunate tonight to have Greg Monzel with us here from the Persimmon Herb School to talk about foraging and native plant conservation and how the two are closely linked and aligned and, and one of the same. Greg Monzel is a student of nature with a gift for nourishing deep connections between people and plants. He has been a practicing herbal education educator, medicine maker and grower since 2008. He and his wife co-founded Persimmon Herb School in 2015 to hold plant-centered space and build and to build a healing community. Greg, thank you so much for being here tonight and for your discussion. Everybody, what we normally do is um, wait until the end where we leave room for questions and answers. How and you can enter any questions in the chat if there are any clarifying, clarifying questions as we go. Um, I might just go ahead and, and briefly interrupt you, Greg, to ask a question so we can clarify that. Otherwise, we will be waiting until for Q&A until the end of the presentation. Any questions before we get started? Sounds good. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so yeah, thanks, Brooke, for having me here and for everybody for joining us tonight. I am excited to talk with you all about uh, something I'm very passionate about, which is foraging and conservation of native plants, in particular, the useful plants that I rely on for my uh, for making a living in this world and for being here on the planet. It, you know, my main points with you, I hope they come through clearly. And um, by all means, I'm happy to have discussion on here. So if there's anything that you want to know, if there's anything that um, I'm not getting to or isn't clear, please do chime in and uh, we'll get it sorted out. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a slideshow for you all. Here in Indianapolis, um, from ancestral land that was occupied and um, originally settled by um, the Miami people, the Lenape, and um, the Kickapoo people. And it's very important to me to acknowledge, you know, my colonial history in this landscape, especially as a forager. Um, many of the wild exotic invasive plants are things that uh, you know colonizers and our people have brought from distant lands into North America and uh, we have I think a um, a duty a role in managing those plants and also in um, um, stewarding the native plants that are here and really thinking about the ways that people who have lived here and co-adapted with some of these wild food plants, um, how they've done it in the past, and I think look to them as a model. And so I hope to do honor by them uh, in my foraging in this presentation. And if, uh, if I do otherwise, please let me know. Uh, Persimmon Herb School, which uh, as Brooke mentioned, I founded with my wife in 2015. Um, we are a home-based herb school and yoga studio, and we offer lots of different classes, including seasonal intensives, and uh, just one day herb workshops, community yoga, and I also make clinical, uh, I make herbal products and I do clinical consultations for folks in herbal medicine too. So if any of this is interesting to you and you want to follow up with more, check out our website, it's persimmonherbschool.com. And I'm excited to present on this topic, intersections of foraging and conservation. Uh, this has really been something I've been thinking about for a long time, something I think that this group uh, would be passionate about also. And so I'm really grateful to be here and have the opportunity to share this with you. And um, I think that people and plants are better together. I think that we separate a lot of, uh, a lot of times we separate humanity from nature. And I think that's a, it does us all a disservice that we are uh, in fact an inherent part of nature and a important uh, keystone species in our ecology and how we behave in relationship with nature is actually of the essence for our times with climate change and um, all the stuff that we're facing out there. Um, just to put it in perspective, I have, you know, in terms of climate change here in Indiana, I have two parents who have each lost a home due to climate related disasters, one to a flood on the Tippecanoe River and another to wildfire. 
in California. So, you know, my life has been directly impacted by climate change already. Maybe you have felt it as well. Our ecology is definitely feeling it. Um, the globe, the economy, it's all, we're all feeling it, I think. Hopefully you're, hopefully you're feeling it. Um, if you're not, I don't know, look into that. But uh, anyway, so that's part of kind of my impetus for teaching about this and for wanting to kind of increase our thinking about foraging and conservation. So tonight my objectives with this are to kind of talk a little about the benefits of foraging, put it in some historical context for maybe why we have some feelings or some tension between the conservation and foraging community and where we can maybe resolve some of that. And then yeah, how we can look forward to, you know, what is good foraging practices? What are good policies as land managers and as um, maybe, maybe nature habitat restorationists? What are, what are some good policies and practices we could have to help encourage foraging? So why forage? For 95% of our human history as a species, we have been foragers, hunter gatherers. And agriculture has really only emerged in that last 5%, um, largely as a result of foraging practices and taking home seeds that were gathered from wild crops back to settlement sites where those seeds fell to the ground and found germination sites. And then um, those seeds that have been selected by the harvesters, which were bigger, easier to gather, all that sort of stuff started to differentiate on a population basis from their wild counterparts. So it's really from foraging that we get agriculture. And in foraging plants, one thing that's really different than eating out of the grocery store or even your garden is the unique diversity in nutrients and flavors that you can find. I've put together foraged meals where I counted the number of families of plants into the dozens. And that's just not the kind of diversity in, um, in plants that you'll find in the grocery store. Most of the time in the grocery store, you'll find maybe up to 15 different families of plants and the chemistry varies widely from family to family. And you can get some interesting things, interesting flavors, interesting nutrients into your body by diving into some wild food. So I do think it's great uh, from a health perspective to do a little bit of foraging. And plants, the ecology, that has supported people and supported the habitat here um, where you live. So I think that's a great way to connect and deepen your relationship with the land, with the plants, with the ecology. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Somebody said mushrooms. There are mushrooms in that picture. Those are chicken of the woods mushrooms. I love, I love harvesting mushrooms. Um, that's like for me, so I, I live in a family. I'm a meat eater. My wife is a vegetarian. And I do foraging mostly of plants. That's so like I'll be out looking for a certain plant that I might be gathering. And mushrooms are like the bonus. They're like the icing on the cake. They're like the thing I can take home for an easy dinner. Um, a lot of times they're just out there. I love mushrooms. So thank you for chiming in, whoever shouted out mushrooms. Um, so value of the landscape without having to log it for timber. And so I think that encouraging some of these high value species might be important in helping to conserve some of our older growth forests. So I want, you know, anybody who's on here is a conservation land manager, maybe think about some ways that this could impact your work a little bit for those older growth forests. And I think also foraging can help put some pressure on these invasive plants. So a lot of invasive plants are, again, plants that were brought here um, by colonists that, that have now gone wild and maybe naturalized, maybe not so healthily, maybe kind of aggressively. And we can put pressure on those plants. Maybe they don't have natural herbivores here, but we can be those herbivores by selecting them. So that first photo I had was, you know, garlic mustard on a cutting board. That's because you can, you can eat it, right? It's a good way to help maybe think about managing some of these things and weeds even in your garden, your landscape, if you're on a smaller scale. Um, you can definitely be the herbivore. And it's just fun. Kids love to connect with it. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a, just a nice thing. I think fondly about my grandparents and my father and other people that I foraged with. It really does, there's something about the ancient um, self care kind of ritual of putting those nutrients in your body right there off of a plant growing in the wild, connecting with the other people that you're with 
there's a state of mind you get in that's very different. And it's just a unique experience. If you haven't foraged with somebody, or you haven't foraged invisibly, give it a try sometime. Okay, so we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna kind of get into a historical context. I'm going to break this down on a species basis and give you some examples of things. Things that have, you know, native plants that have been foraged and, you know, we'll look at how things have gone not so well in a couple of cases, maybe several cases and things that are going well in other cases and how we can have a role as humans in helping to support some of the diversity in our landscape and in these species in particular. So this first uh, species that I'm that I'm presenting here is yellow lady slipper orchids. And there's really a couple of varieties here. Um, the Cypripediums parviflorum, there's variety parviflorum, there's variety something else named after some light guy. But the point is these, these herbs were gathered largely kind of in the prime of herbal medicine in the United States, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and were decimated by foragers. And so these are something, these are plants that were once common in our landscape and are now just not very common. These pictures I took down in Hoosier National Forest, and just so you know, with the, except for a couple exceptions, these are all photos that I've taken. Um, and they were gathered because the roots, the root extracts do elevate the moon without sedating someone terribly. Um, so they are a beneficial thing. They were given largely um, for gynecological disorders and um, and other, you know, nerve mind disorder, nervous system disorders, and all kinds of different things. And um, to the point where they are, in a lot of places, much more rare than they used to be. And there are, there is an invasive orchid, the Epipactus helleborine, in the northern part of our state. Um, I have harvested it in mulch, like in outside of high rises apartments in Milwaukee. I've seen it throughout uh, many different states, like as a roadside orchid. Um, Epipactus. I've seen it come up next to Florida potties. So it is a, it's odd to see an invasive orchid, but it's a great substitute. And just this kind of thinking of like, where can we maybe shift foraging pressure? If, if you are a forager, where can we shift foraging pressure onto invasive plants, from native plants to invasive plants? What can we do to then support those populations of native plants? This is one of the few plants on the critical list of at-risk medicinal species by United Plant Savers, which is, I'll talk a little more about that in a moment, but they're one of my favorite uh, conservation organizations and they are really, you know, at the forefront of the country in medicinal plant conservation specifically. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, the latest of our work is sort of the canary in the coal mine, if you will, of like the first, you know, one of the first species that was really in decline as a result of foraging pressures in the United States. American ginseng has had a lot more pressure. Uh, it's been a little more robust plant in terms of population and um, it was an incredibly important colonial export um, beginning you know, in the, uh, what, gosh, revolutionary era all the way through the modern day. 99% of ginseng harvests are shipped to China and we go into Asian markets from there. And the American ginseng, Panax quinquefolius, is considered a superior medicine to the Asian species. So it is highly sought after. Single roots of American ginseng plants have sold for over six figures in Chinese markets. And those don't even get consumed. They get put into shadow boxes and put on the corporate, you know, boardroom walls and stuff like that. Really wild stuff. The roots of our native species here, they typically sell, you know, market price. pressure on folks to poach these plants. So desperate people in rural places have, you know, really over harvested American thing to the extent where in Indiana, I've never seen it in a sufficient population where I felt like I could harvest it here. I've never harvested American ginseng. I would love to. And I've planted hundreds of seeds throughout, you know, forests in central Indiana. And hopefully we'll see what happens with that. Um, but that's just, you know, this is one way, again, of increasing our non-timber forest crops in Indiana. This is something that's done elsewhere, more in Appalachian economy areas and stuff. But I think in Indiana, there's a lot of potential also for ginseng forest cultivation. And um, that this can be, an, again, an ally for conservation by increasing the value of a forest. And, you know, it's something that can actually be harvested and sustained 
uh, without cutting down timber. I think that's a really valuable thing to consider. Um, in Indiana, diggers, which I, is what I, you know, we kind of call poachers of uh, ginseng and golden seal, they have overharvested, and it's led to, you know, the only season that we have on harvesting a plant in Indiana. And the, if you think about ginseng with a season, you know, it is regulated to. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So yeah, ginseng has been banned in Indiana. Um, harvesting it at least has been banned in national and state forests and elsewhere um, and for good cause because I've, I've known plenty of people who have land and are herbalists and maybe even who grow some ginseng um, who have found diggers on their property poaching po poaching the roots um, creating quite a bit of disturbance in the environment definitely not leaving kind of a leave no trace using leave no trace type policy and uh, really decimating population really quickly with hand tools and um, you know we're talking rich uh, native forest plant communities here. So it is definitely a problem. I've even heard of, um, I don't know if they're doing it in this state, but other states at least, they're radio tagging individual roots of ginseng so that if they make it into trade or commerce, they can be traced back to who harvested that and who is poaching, poaching it out of public land. Um, so it's something that people are definitely concerned about, something we should be concerned about because it is a tremendously valuable native plant and um, it will be, you know, like the Asian species, it will be over harvested to the brink of extinction if we're not more careful. Advance this, there we go. Um, this plant gets harvested side by side with, with ginseng. So not as expensive as golden seal, hydrastis canadensis, um, these have a yellow pigment in them that is the source of berberine and other alkaloids that have a tremendous antimicrobial effect. And I know a lot of folks who take it sort of as an antibiotic, I don't recommend that, but um, a lot of people who do. And um, it's, uh, it has a pretty high market, market value. I think last time I paid close to $120 a pound for dried golden seal powder. I felt like I got a pretty decent deal for a really good quality forest cultivated uh, golden seal. And so this leads to people harvesting it. People call it yala root around here. So we might hear sang for ginseng and yala root for golden seal. Those are the plants people are talking about. Um, it took me a while <laughs> to know what people were saying. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, these are, this population is also in decline in Indiana. It is Still pretty good. I've seen a lot of good stains of, of golden seal in Indiana, but it's something we need to be mindful of. And also, again, it's one of these opportunities. This is potentially something marketable. Um, so if you are, you know, managing private land, this is especially, you know, maybe talking to you, um, how can you, again, get some value from your forest land without it cutting down, you know, having to be so invasive and damaging as cutting down lots of timber. Um, this is also on the at-risk list for United Plant Savers. And see the morning United Plant Savers, they have, um, they're the home of the Golden Seal Sanctuary in Rutland, Ohio, which is thought to be the world's largest uh, single population of Golden Steel. And it was reclaimed mining land that my, one of my teachers, Paul Strauss, uh, bought and started to farm and work and plant, uh, manage for native plants and for uh, high quality forage uh, items. And uh, he has essentially regrown that landscape to be incredibly productive and donated roughly half of his original acreage to the United Plant Savers in their conception. And so now they have a beautiful center there um, that you can go to and learn more about medicinal plant conservation and the medicinal plant trade, which so they are not anti-medicinal plant trade by any means. They make recommendation, policy recommendations about sourcing and try to raise awareness around plants that are under harvest pressure. Uh, things like sandalwood, um, things like even sundews um, can be under pressure. So anyway. Great organization to know. They are just about five hours away in southeastern Ohio. It's an easy day drive to get over there for a conference. They have a medicinal plant conservation certificate program that you can do. And uh, just really awesome, wonderful people over there that are working to conserve some of these species. 
you might be familiar with grapes. So we've talked a little bit about medicinal plant trade. Now we're jumping into food plants a little bit. And so these are another one of our rich forest plants, um, another forest perennial. So again, we're talking about a pretty delicate habitat in Indiana to be going into disturbing for foraging. So I would use tremendous caution. Uh, again, with ginseng, I have never seen it in a stand big enough to harvest in Indiana. I consider it kind of off limits. I don't like to see, I don't want to see anybody here posting pictures of their ginseng harvest later after this, or I will be after you. Um, there's two different varieties of ramps in our area. And so we have Allium trichocum, there's variety trichocum here, um, and then another, um, another variety here named for some guy who, you know, differentiate between these species and uh, or varieties. They may be different species, some are treating them as different species, some are treating different varieties. I don't know that we have the genetic knowledge, understanding yet to know. Uh, I haven't looked for that information. So if you know, if you know if there's been genetic sequencing on these two to know if they're definitively varieties or different species, I would be curious to know. Um, there are local wholesale markets. So people I've heard of here in Indianapolis offering up to $700 for a hundred pound batch of ramps to foragers like myself. And that is just kind of mind boggling to me. Like you can imagine how if you maybe didn't have a day job, but you had some time on your hands and you knew what ramps were, uh, you could go do quite a bit of damage in a forest pretty quick to get to 100 pounds of ramps um, to make your 700 bucks. I have often witnessed people poaching these in very inappropriate places, like let's say in front of the Eagle, you know, Eagle Creek Nature Center. There's a little patch of ramps, and I saw people out there one day harvesting out right there, and I stopped and scolded them. Um, that's not, you know, there's there's a difference between. I'm going to make a distinction between ethical foraging and poaching or digging, you know, these kind of things where it's, there's more of an economic incentive and a little bit more of a thoughtless approach. Like these plants are, you know, as you know, alive, somewhat sentient in their own way. They are tasting the air. They are um, feeling your footsteps in different ways. Some of them uh, can hear sounds, you know, very clearly like corn plants that we've studied. There's a lot more going on in plants from an awareness perspective than we even know. And um, so we need to be just a little more respectful and slow down when you're harvesting anything, um, especially these kind of native plants. Don't put a lot of pressure on them. We have wild uh, onions, for instance. So here's another example where you've got an invasive wild, uh, you know, these garlic chives, what is it, Allium schizopenum or something that grow wild here and make a delicious wild onion powder, wild onion salt. We, we sell a wild onion salt made from the uh, invasive onions. And that can take a lot of pressure off of these native plants. Restaurant demand is really high for ramps. I see them on the menu every spring. And when I see those foragers out there, nature preserves, digging up ramps. Uh, and then I go to the restaurant and see them selling ramps. I really wonder like, where is this stuff coming from? And did the, does the chef know? That these where these were harvested from uh, is anybody paying attention to this? Is the is the person eating this paying attention to this? So do some you know do some work if you're eating it and you're like oh wow ramps I think those are great you know that's a native plant we need to support native plant value and so I support eating ramps um, but find out where they came from find out who's harvesting those and if they're doing a good job or not um, there's definitely better and worse ways to do it. The city of Chicago gets its name from ramps. So the native name for them up there was applied to the river, the Chicago River, and then that's where the name Chicago came from. There is some interesting work around research uh, with the sustainability of ramp harvesting. There was a study that was highly promoted where growth rates were measured in undisturbed forest habitats and they were found to be extremely low, like, you know, a patch of ramps would grow roughly 1% uh, in a given year. And the conclusion that the scientists came through to from this were that there's really no amount of foraging that is sustainable for ramps. And for foragers of ramps who have had experience tending stands of them over years, they know that that's not exactly true. And so there's a high profile forager, foraging instructor and author, Sam Thayer, who tested growth rates and measured these in the uh, locations where he was harvesting. And um, both his 40 acre site, as well as another ally, you know, family site where he forages ramps as well. 
And I think if I recall correctly, he harvests roughly 20% of the ramps in a given colony. And that's where he stops and lets the rest regenerate. Um, and he kind of collects them, I think, from around the margins of the clump. Um, but I forget all the details exactly on how he harvests. People harvest in different ways. And at the other site, they harvest in different ways. So he looked at two different ways of harvesting. And in both cases found that the growth rate is a lot higher in those disturbed conditions from harvesting. And I think it's interesting. I was on a plant walk with um, some DNR folks and they discussed about how, you know, the maple trees were kind of becoming dominant in a lot of our forests and out competing other seedlings, largely because of the buildup of the, uh, the duff and like the debris, the leaves and, and sticks that fall to the forest floor that they were blocking germination sites for a lot of other species, but the maples were tough enough to find their way down there with their little root, their little radicals out of their seed and find some soil. And, um, you know, this, this is another place where like, here's maybe some disturbance in the landscape is missing from our, our current, you know. Our landscape used to be home to elk and uh, bison and bear and uh, gosh, if you go back further, mastodon and sloth and all kinds of critters that aren't here anymore. We have plants that are still evolved to, to cohabitate with those species. And so there are maybe some ecological services that we can fill for some of these missing species in our landscape. Because why are they not here? Well, largely due to human pressure. And so if we can be aware of that and we can understand the ecology, we can see how maybe some of our practices, maybe through foraging even, can lead to an increase in some of these species that are under pressure and um, continue to find a good value for them. Um, you know, Sam on his 40 acres makes a six figure income from two main crops, ramps and maple syrup, two very high value non-timber forest products. And it helps him to conserve that 40 acres, which is now, you know, gosh, 30 years older, I think maybe 20 years older from when he bought it. And uh, that's a lot of tree growth. 20 years of tree growth is quite a bit. And, um, you know, he's got a family that'll probably maintain it the way he's maintained it. That's a small family conservation project right there. Um, and if one small family can do it, surely there's more. I'm just doing a quick time check here. So, okay. So um, this next plan is just a dream to work with and is um, highlights a different issue, a different area of concern that we have with harvesting some of these things. So manuma or wild rice, as you may know it, is a really important crop, especially in Minnesota, Wisconsin, even Michigan to some degree, of course Canada. Um, Zizania aquatica is one species and Zizania palustris is the other. Let's see, the palustris. Uh, one, of, one of them we know is river rice, one of them we know is lake rice. Um, my pictures here, the one on the left is river rice that's taken from a river here in Indiana and they have a branched panicle on there. I think that's Zizania palustris. And then in the other picture here where there's a person sitting in a canoe harvesting, that's my foraging partner Ross. I believe that's Zizania aquatica, which has um, a largely unbranched panicle of seeds with the ripe seeds pressed to the, um, the stems. And um, you'll find these in different places. So Indiana has more of the river rice and where I've been harvested and largely in the northern parts, the lake rice is more predominant. And um, manure has an incredibly dense nutritional profile. So besides being a really rich source of carbohydrate, which is hard to find in nature, it has a lot of other micro minerals and vitamins and is a very important food crop, especially to the Menominee who get their name, from their name literally means the people of the, the, the rice, you know, the wild rice, um, people of the manure and uh, other Ojibwe peoples who uh, have been called to harvest this crop. And uh, it's, um, so there's this rich Native American tradition of relying on this plant as a food source and as a sacred plant. Uh, when I went to harvest, one of my experiences, I met uh, someone who came down, his name was Michael, he told us. And he, uh, you know, when he showed up at, um, the canoe dock where we had brought in our harvest from the day, it felt like we were in trouble a little bit. He was Native American and he came down and he was like, looking at our harvest and uh, uh, I said, oh, you know, my friend Michael 
broke the ice with them, started chatting with them, and he was like, oh yeah, I used to, you know, I grew up on a reservation in Minnesota, and I used to harvest rice, uh, but we didn't do it like this, you know, and uh, we were like, oh, gosh, okay, you know, what are we doing, what's, what was different, he's like, well, we harvested it in specially made white cedar boats that we only use for wild rice harvesting, they wore special clothes for it, uh, there were certain songs that were sung, a whole, a whole, all kinds of ritual elements to it. I mean, we showed up to um, a elder who was making a tobacco offering and represented some of the areas, um, spiritual, you know, a spiritual leader of some of the areas, uh, natives. And it was still not, you know, just because we were there for that ceremony didn't mean that we were harvesting in any traditional way. And as a someone from a colonial, you know, ancestry going into this, I was a bit of a tourist and I definitely had gotten some feedback about that. And I think it's warranted. It's a cautious place we need to tread lightly uh, when we are going out to gather somebody else's traditional food crops. And um, in Indiana, it's really lost a lot of its range primarily due to stream channelization, but also to pollution. Wild rice does not tolerate sulfate in particular. And so the sulfate level, levels rise in our waterways, it makes rice not a viable thing anymore. For people that I've known who have gathered wild rice, it is a peak foraging experience. There's nothing quite like being in a boat, in a rice paddy with a partner, putting rice in the bottom of the boat for a day. Uh, there's a timeless quality that it takes on. There's a sound of clicking harvesting sticks and whooshing grains and um, and the push, you know, the steady kind of push and stop of the boat. Um, and for indigenous people who are reclaiming these traditions as well, there it's it's a peak foraging experience for them too. So I, uh, I was on a call with some other native plant folks and uh, Danny Tipman of the Miami Nation. And she talked about how, you know, the, when she found her spot for wild rice, it was 10 acres, and she was just elated to find it. Um, and it's taken her some time to get, really get it figured out, but it was just an awesome experience to harvest it. And now after they've traditionally harvested it and got the first DNR permit to harvest wild rice in Indiana, um, their 10 acre site has expanded to 20 acres of wild rice. So wild rice is not only incredibly important for human habitat, but it's great habitat for waterfowl. Um, it creates an environment for small fishes, crustaceans, snails, all kinds of life is making a home in these rice paddies. The lake in Michigan where I harvested from, it was reintroduced in the 1970s um, for, by Ducks Unlimited for duck hunters. And it's been a very contentious thing in this lake where boat owners don't like it because it kind of, um, overwhelms part of the lake. It's a shallow lake. Rice needs shallow water, shallow mucky water. Um, and it grows primarily in the water until it sends up its seed up out of the water. And, um, but it's great habitat for the birds, great habitat for a lot of things. And it's by both colonists and um, native people have increased harvest pressure on decreased amount of stock. It's decreased because of habitat loss primarily. Um, but as I mentioned, when in the case of the Miami people who are reclaiming this tradition, the harvest practices can actually lead to increased supply. So it turns out humans are pretty inefficient collectors of wild rice and we drop a lot of it over the side of the boat. And a lot of it goes down in the water at the right time and it's ripe and goes down there and finds its home, finds a germination site in there. So that's one of our roles in ecology. You know, I mentioned, you know, humans and ecology, we are integral. And part of our role is seed dispersal and creating disturbance for germination sites. We have to be conscious about this, of course, like going in with the backhoe is not the way to go, but we can gently forage, we can gently manage land to help to create more diversity in the population. And I think it's, there's some wisdom to increasing the diversity of these, um, these human foods that have been traditionally stewarded by people in our landscape. 
Uh, anyway, okay. May I, may I interrupt for yes. a moment? Um, because I think that this is a good time to ask this question. Linda asked, how is the rice gleaned from the plant? Is the plant cut and then the grain removed? No. And it's not cut back, is it? Could you just it's uh, not clarify? Absolutely, yeah. The um, So the grain is threshed right off the plant, essentially. So when rice is ripe, the seed dehisses from the panicle, so it, it just wants to fall off, right? Like a ripe persimmon, it just splats onto the ground. The rice just wants to fall off into the water. So um, harvesters use a pair of sticks, and one stick is used to kind of draw the rice over the boat, and the other stick is brushed across it, so the seeds drop into the boat. But again, we're inefficient at it. Um, the native terms for it translate into combing Mother Nature's hair. And so it is a process of like this. So we're just kind of gently brushing. There's great care is taken not to damage the rice, not to break the stems, and um, also not to uproot the, uh, the root structure as you're pushing this canoe, canoe through a paddy with a pole. There's no other way to get through it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of care taken to the process for sure. And that's something where, as a person with a colonial ancestry, I don't have the traditional background. I don't have a teacher. I don't, there's not somebody, you know, I, I didn't grow up in a family harvesting wild rice, and so we need this, but colonists need, you know, people with colonial history need this. People with uh, native history, I think, want this too, for everybody better harvesting rice and taking better care of it. Um, but because of increased pressure, there's been, there's been some tension between the native community on this lake and non-native community um, with who can access, who rightfully, who has the rights to this rice. And, um, you know, under some treaties, indigenous people alone have rights to that rice, interestingly. And so in one lawsuit here in uh, August 2021, the White Earth Nation, um, a band of Ojibwe sued the state of Minnesota on behalf of the rice for violating the rice's rights over a DNR decision to allow oil pipeline construction with billions of water which impacted the rice in Lower Rice Lake. And because their people depend on this as an economic crop and as a food crop, uh, it, it impacts them. And so the state made a decision that impacts them. And uh, this is one of these rights of nature lawsuits that are being used to help try to enforce the Clean Water Act. Seems like something we should all want. Um, but definitely, you know, people who depend on clean water for their food, um, it's very important stuff. So there's a level of importance in this for Native people, whereas for somebody like me, who's like a forager from colonial background, it's more like a tourist thing. Like, this is cool and fun and interesting. And yes, it connects me to the land, but um, we've got a lot to learn. We've got a lot to learn as, as white people um, in what's happened in, in our history and coming to some terms with that and how much we need to learn from the native people who have been managing this land for thousands of years. And it's, it's really the legacy of their work that has resulted in the type of diversity on our landscape that we see. And part of the collapse of that diversity right now with the, um, you know, the extinction event that we are in um, is in part because we are so blind to how to manage this land. And we have destroyed and corrupt, corroded these relationships that we really need uh, to rebuild. So I, I hope that part of what you're thinking about coming out of this is how do we rebuild connections with Native people? How can we, um, you know, we're interested in Native plant conservation. Like, what about Native people conservation in Indiana? Because there are so many people living here. Uh, there's no reservation for people in, in, in Indiana for, for natives, you know, there's um, what, what, what are some ways that we can maybe bring that presence back for the benefit of plants and ecology in our landscape? And how also can we become better in relationships? So how can we become naturalized in a way as colonists? So some lessons to kind of learn that I hope that we are emerging from this. Um, we want to make sure we're doing thoughtful, sensitive harvesting. So is this ours to take? Is this it's right or does it feel like it's wrong? I think that's really important when you're foraging. Um, humans are integral with nature. We depend on each other. That seems obvious, I hope. Um, but I think a lot of us kind of forget about this in our day-to-day -day context. 
we sit in our houses and we get in our cars and we uh, do things for nature, but we don't, you know, we often kind of are a little bit hands off, like this is for nature over here, not for us, but we're really part of that nature and nature needs us to interact. Nature needs us to be a more active participant, I think, in promoting diversity of plants. And hopefully, you know, we can challenge the beliefs that separate us from each other and separate us from nature, that um, we all have a right to accessing these plants and that it is in some ways your birthright as a human to be able to go out and forage and gather plants. Here are some quick foraging suggestions. I know we're running kind of late here. Um, always make sure you're properly identifying your plants and get permission before harvesting anything. Never harvest the first plant, the last plant, um, or you know, like more than you need. And make sure you leave some for the next person. If you're harvesting from a population of native plants, I never take more than 10% of a native population. So let's say I'm harvesting angelica roots somewhere and I know I need 10 of them. I wanna find um, a population of plants that's not the first population, not the second population that I've found in a given area. And I want there to be a hundred plants in there. get bigger, it will thrive from your participation. Um, and eat the weeds, eat the invasive plants in your landscape. That's one way we can help control them. It's what we brought them here for, right? So like uh, your plantain, your dandelion, your chicory, your wild lettuces, all kinds of plants uh, were brought here by colonists to eat. And we might as well make use of them if we're trying to get them out of our landscape because they're invasive or exotic or weedy. And just to wrap things up, here's a few resources for you. Uh, the United Plant Savers website, uh, unitedplantsavers.com. Sam Thayer, you can find him and uh, family at foragersharvest.com. They have a lot of really cool foraged uh, items for sale, like uh, hickory nut oils and even acorn oil and uh, great books on foraging if you're looking for a book and pretty good recommendations on gathering with caution and with care. And uh, here's the article about wild rice and its rights in court. It is at the Minnesota Reformer newspaper. And here, personally, actually, we're offering a file intensive that is uh, called Intentional Foraging, Safety, Ethics, and Stewardship. So if you want to do a deep dive in this, um, we will, again, kind of cover this stuff through the, you know, through the context of individual plants. We'll be gathering together in the fall. It's big foraging time for nuts and fruits and seeds and things. So very important times. So we're kind of, you know, planning our intensives around the seasons. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. There you are. And I will invite any questions that are out there. Thank you, Greg. That was a wonderful presentation and full of great information. Um, one question we had, uh, Mary asked on the ramps if it um, is the roots that are eaten, and I believe it's the bulb that is sought after, and Sue Arnold chimed in that the leaves are also particularly tasty in preparation. I would agree with all the above, yes. I, um, you know, especially after that article came out that was like, hey, you know, we shouldn't be harvesting ramps at all. I jumped on that and I was like, hey, you know, everybody, we should really knock it off. Don't be digging up ramps, so let me catch you digging up a ramp. Um, you can harvest the leaves, <clears throat> and they'll regenerate, right? That seems like good foraging practices. And I still recommend that to a lot of people, uh, especially if you're just looking for that taste. Um, for a market ramp, you're going to need the bulb. Really, that's kind of what your culinary folks are looking for. There's more flavor, more of that garlicky flavor in the bulb, and less of the sulfury uh, bitter tones. So definitely superior flavor in the bulb, but you don't need it. You don't need it. Greg, can you tell us, um, can ramps be harvested or can they be cultivated outside of um, wild spaces in the national and state green spaces? Is it being grown in agroforestry, for instance, by farmers? 
I don't believe that I know of specific circumstances of people doing this much, but it is definitely possible The pictures that I had in there uh, were actually from my garden here where I have established small ramp populations and um, you know, I use what's in my garden when I can. It's not always enough for what I would like, but um, unfortunately here in central Indiana, there's plenty of disturbed locations that are going under the knife, so to speak, of development and um, there are ramps there to be had. So that's another opportunity. Um, you know, I know that the Native Plant Society was involved with the Holiday Farms uh, project and relocating some of those plants. There were a lot of ramps in there. I know because my mother-in-law lived there well before any of that development happened. And so I got to roam around in those hundreds of acres of beautiful central Indiana hardwood forest, um, gathering ramps and other things for many years before. So um, it's definitely possible. And I think it's an underutilized resource. Like that's something that we need to be doing more of. That, you know, that's what I hope you kind of get from this. Like these forest products are really important, you know, Reestablishing wild rice is a really tough order. We're talking about cleaning up streams and creating habitat. You know, how do you unchannelize a stream? You know, you're talking about all kinds of different things going on with that. So, um, but ramps seem like an easy one that we can we can go. Yeah, you can grow ramps from seed. I see that in the chat. I have tried planting ramps from seed and have not had success with mine germinating. But maybe you'll have better luck than I. The flowers do come up after the leaves have died back to the ground. So sometimes seeing those harvesting those can be tricky, but if you know your ramps and you'll you'll find those little doll eye looking little seeds, those little beady eyes of seeds they have. So but you getting them established from roots is easy. You can dig up a few roots somewhere, there's an adequate population, eat the leaves, eat the roots, and then get your own little population established. And pretty soon you won't have to go to your friend's house anymore. Yeah, I personally, I unwittingly brought some home from Holiday Park with me on some spice bush. So um, nice. it's pretty exciting to discover. Can you say um, in terms of any of the other species you discussed, such as um, ginger, ginseng, is any of that being cultivated, such as in agroforestry or in any other method? For sure, yes. There's a lot more effort to farm ginseng and these forest grown type because there is such a big market for it. So definitely ginseng and golden seal get grown in forestry. And if you want information on that, go to United Plant Savers. They'll have resources there. Also, just throw out there, I do um, wild food tours as well. So these are um, events I'm partnering with Kelly Schuyler on these, and she makes foraged foods and serves those. And then I do a little plant walk part. So you can come join us for a walk and uh, enjoy a little forage food at the end. It's quite a lovely experience, if I do say so myself. Um, so I'll just put that up in the chat too, wildfoodtours.com. Thank you. If you're interested. Thank you. Really inspired also to try and um, start cultivating the ramps a little more like you are at home. Um, I think it's a very interesting uh, fact that you shared about them. Um, and I think it makes sense considering it's a bulb that they're more productive in disturbed land. So uh, that's, that's pretty inspiring. Brooke, you're from, uh, or you spent some time at least in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. There's a good case there of the um, Camassia. The Camas, yes. Right. And um, the native people had stopped gathering it and it was in decline in the coastal plains. And then they went back in and started gathering it again and started to see more camas, right? Started to increase mm -hmm. the population through the traditional stewardship practices. Indeed. And, I think that's, and with, the, with the burning as well. And that's something we can do here, you know, that is part of that indigenous process of land management is burning more. Um, it sounds a little scary. It does, and especially burning like a forest. But uh, there are some forests that are well adapted to it and might need it. And um, yeah. And we do have researchers at Purdue that specialize, um, especially in that, in bur you know, burning, but burning in forests because it does sound scary and dangerous, but um, it can be done, has obviously been done for a very long time and done well and has been a major 
um, tool for conservation and biodiversity. So um, yeah, well-managed burning. I think, um, you know, I think that another presentation that we really need to um, hunt down is something talking a little bit more about traditional ecological knowledge and um, how traditions over time have really helped preserve and expand our ecology and what we can learn from um, indigenous people about conservation. Sign me up. Okay, done. I think I think there's good reason that um, indigenous people have protected a lot of these things and are not super willing to share uh, foraging information <laughs> and practices and traditions and you know uh, that's our loss and maybe there's some way that we can be better. Maybe there's a way we can do better. I see somebody, Gwen mentions in the um, chat here, uh, Robin Wall Kimmler's book, and she was just here speaking recently. Hopefully somebody got to see her. Uh, her book, Sweet, Braiding Sweetgrass, is fantastic and uh, just beautiful examples of stewardship and conservation and um, yeah, living with, with the land, for sure. Great book. Cool. I'm thankful for being here. I'm thankful for the opportunity to share this stuff with you. And I'm involved with this group. Um, love plants and love ecology, and that you're all in this for the best reasons. So thank you for being here and for being. Thank you, Greg. It's been a wonderful hour, and I know I found it really inspiring and a uh, new way to look at both foraging and harvesting, but also cultivating some of our native plants for different uses, as well as I think the really good point about um, harvesting our invasives as well. Um, I haven't made um, garlic mustard pesto yet, but I would really like to. Um, I think that that's a, that's a very good point about one aspect of managing invasive plants around here, understanding how we can use them. My favorite part of garlic mustard are the little florets, like the little broccoli-like florets when they're just starting to bloom. And then you're taking that seed out also. I've tried working with the seeds and they're quite bitter. They're not really, you know, I was like, ooh, what if I could make a good mustard with garlic mustard seeds? But it was not delicious. No. Okay, good to know. Unfortunately, yeah. Good to know. But experiment. You know, if you know what not to eat, you can experiment a little bit. There are lots of knot weeds that uh, the seeds have been eaten traditionally. So polygonum genus plants, a lot of them are not native and can be quite weedy. And those seeds can be eaten. Um, there's a lot of little seed crops out there, amaranths and lambs quarters and things that you could you could eat. You could <laughs> you could grow it and you could eat it. And uh, and it can be a really nice way to connect and a, and a great way to utilize the resources that might otherwise just go to waste. If only we could get a good calorie pear recipe. <laughs> Those little calorie pears, ugh, they are mealy. Just. All right. Thanks again, Greg. Until next time, we appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you.